Welcome back again to what will be the weekend edition of Red Star Radio, this time coming to you with a very special guest joining us for a conversation today. And I'll, without further ado, throw over to Layla, who is going to introduce said guest. So we're very pleased to be speaking with Angela Nagel, who is the author of Kill All Normies and has written in multiple journals, including the Washington Post and American Affairs. She has recently started writing on Substack over at angelanagel.substack.com. So thank you so much much for joining us, Angela. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, so we, we want to get you on because um, something me and Alex have been stressing out a lot about lately, especially with uh, all of the stuff around COVID-19 and the way in which people have been censored and have been, um, you know, slandered for just, you know, expressing even mild dissenting opinions on COVID-19. And we've experienced this as well in our own lives. Um, is just kind of the state of the intellectual environment and um, you know, the importance of free speech and all these different things. And I know this is something that you've experienced p- earlier than us, like when you came out with your kind of heterodox opinions a few years earlier. Um, so uh, something that really came to the fore for me, especially, is the state of the intellectual environment um, from the natural to the social sciences. It's like very bad. Um, you know, I, I found that during COVID, scientists are not able to just describe what's going on anymore. Like they're just able to uh, reinforce propaganda a lot of the time. But, you know, intellectuals from all fields of, of knowledge are not able to just do the bare minimum and explain and describe how society exists like as, as, it, as it exists, let alone make any predictions as to how things are going to go. So a good example of this is, of course, the natural sciences being able to Hardly being able to just describe the current state of the pandemic, but also making um, models that again and again fail to predict what's going to happen. Um, A good example from the the social sciences, of course, is um, I I thought was uh, Robert Paxton, who's quite a decorated historian of fascism, who came out um, a few months ago after the so-called coup. Uh, on the Capitol um, and to declare that Trump is actually could be described as a fascist, which is a reversal on his position that he put forward a few years ago when Trump was elected. So given the very sad state of the intelligentsia, um, what role do you think independent intellectual production can play? Like so such as your own in um, this kind of environment? Yeah, well, it's always hard to know whether you try to stay within the institutions and reform them, you know, or Mm -hmm. whether you just break from them completely and do something independent. Um, You know, the Internet definitely has, well, I suppose in some ways it's made us more conformist and simultaneously opened up, at least for people who are willing to have a bit of courage, um, a kind of space for alternative points of view but um then the problem is if everyone does that there's nobody left in the institutions uh to say anything so it's a very hard call to make and um i think it depends on you have to judge yourself whether if there's any hope in your field then it probably is best to say within the the institutions and do what you can Mm -hmm. um but, you know, if you're in something, if you're in a field where there's like absolutely, where it will be just entirely pointless, um, then, yeah, I think it is best to go independent. Um, and I mentioned to you guys, Justin Murphy, who, you know, I think like he's been talking about for years, he this he thinks that this is like a very viable thing, actually, and going independent is going to be very viable and that the institutions have gotten so bad that you that they have to basically suffer a full um, kind of legitimacy crash, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, but also even economically, you know, they're they're oversubscribed and they don't really even uh, pay like they used to or anything like that. You know, I think like an example. <clears throat> that he used and others to make this argument use is the, if you trace the, um, the, the decline in the amount of money that publishers give for a book for, for an advance um, and how much it has declined uh, over the years and, and things like that. So in other words, like there are fewer benefits to staying mm. 
um, within the institutions all the time. And, you know, like, why would you want to spend, you know, just like toil for like your whole life just to push, <laughs> push the debate just like an inch in, in the right direction, you know, when you can just go independent and then say more or less what you want. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of the call people have to make. I I'm more inclined to say you have to go independent because um, mm. I, I the, it is beyond a point of return. I think for many many institutions. I mean, even something like um, you know Josh Hawley getting his book uh, um, cancelled or whatever. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like that's like a like a, a massive like a. a a political figure of like you know mm. uh, sort of yeah a very famous and sort of like elected political figure who you know if they are doing it to him like what hope is there for a person who has no real contacts or power or you know elite networks or anything mm. um so yeah i think i think going independent is the way forward yeah something i do wonder about uh, i I, I think obviously, like I, my personal opinion is uh, certainly within the social sciences, um, things have been depleted to a very bare amount. Um, I, just kind of viewing the way things have gone for the natural sciences, I think they're also holding a, on by a thread. But I, I don't want to comment too much because I'm not in that field. Um, but I one, something I do worry about is for independent producers and in, and this move towards intellect independent intellectual work is a lack of peer review. So part of part of the benefits of academia was being in a in a, um, an environment where you could speak freely with your colleagues and they could critique your work and and show you, you know, like where you've gone wrong and where you've missed something and your blind spots. And I'm not sure how that will happen in a new kind of decentralized paradigm of intellectual production, you know. Yeah, also the other thing is that um that process was meant to take place among kind of, um, I guess in an, in a like rarefied sort of environment, um, mm. that was somewhat impersonal, you know, like if, if somebody could critique your work, just like they do in a PhD viva or something like that. And it's not like a personal attack on you. <laughs> yeah. Whereas mm -hmm. like in the, when people go independent, sometimes, there becomes a kind of cult of personality around the person who is an outspoken figure. Mm. And then the, the, what should be impersonal critiques end up being personal attacks on them. And, and then you have like, um, you know, people sort of trying to like knock each other out in some way, like as, as like, as almost like competitors. Uh, and that's not really how it should work either. You know, um, so it ends up being a big personalized fight rather than really trying to like seek truth. Mm. Um, so that is also a huge problem. Yeah. And then, then because it's personalized, people will just cling to their position. Mm. Um, you know, so that that's a huge problem too. It, it's hard to see how you could replicate that impersonal, like the function that peer review is supposed to serve mm. um, outside of, that environment, you know. Yeah, and I, I think part of the reason why it becomes so personal is because, um, whereas in academia, you know, I, and this is becoming less and less so, but traditionally you would have tenure, right? So, so an attack on your work did not equal an attack on your income. But if you go independent and attack on your work, it becomes so personal because it becomes an attack directly on your income, um, which is tied to your person and uh, not not through some um, indifferent salary arrangement as with through like tenure is explicitly something that you're given regardless of what you do, what you produce type thing, at least, you know, in theory. Yeah. So it's a, I think it's difficult. I, I think, I think Murphy, Justin Murphy, Murphy that you, who you mentioned, I think, I think it's true that things are changing, but um, yeah, it's hard to see in what direction it might go like uh, to, to kind of, I think the goal should be in the, this change to reinvigorate intel intellectual production, which I I realize, especially during this pandemic, how important it was to have people who, you know, who are able to stand aside and who don't have any vested interests and in, in what's going on and who's able to offer critique. 
Um, yeah, so it's, it's, I think things are getting rearranged, but I can see some downfalls to the current model as well. I haven't, uh, like, when I would see, um, you know, like a, a su- news about some scientist who had a, um, a dissenting view on something about COVID, say, um, and then the next thing would be like an article with like a, a hit pic of them looking crazy. <laughs> and it would say like, this person is just a deranged conspiracy theorist. And of course we know like with hit pieces, you can, you can just basically find like somebody on a crazy forum somewhere reference their work. And then you can link them to that. You know what I mean? And you can make anyone look bad. Basically you can yeah. make anyone look crazy with the, one of these things. Um, but you know, if unless you're really invested in it, right, and you really are obsessed with finding out the truth of uh, like where it came from and what the best policies are and so on, if you're sort of not going to do that, then like you don't have the time to personally go and research the whole biography of everyone who's commented on this, or to you know analyze every single one, every single article that's written to see are there any weird NGOs like co-authoring this, you know, and so on. Um, and so you kind of just tune out at a certain point. Like I, I, I have kind of tuned out to some degree because it would be a full-time job for me to actually go and <laughs> be sure like that I have an independent, like correct view, sure. um, you know, the yeah. amount of work that it would take to do that. So I know in Ireland, for example, there's one lady who, you know, I, I the first thing I saw about her was one of these like hit hit pieces. Um, uh, who was basically anti lockdown to, to cut a long story short. Um, and you know, to I, I still have no idea. You know, if she's like some some sources said that you know she was like a very respected like you know establishment sort of like very apolitical scientists and then others you know others were saying the opposite so yeah i mean th- this is why you have to have these institutions right because ordinary citizens don't have the time to personally go and uncover all of these things you know because as soon as the the covid thing passes there'll be something else you know and unless you're like a full time neat you know and you're going to just like obsessively research every single one of these things yourself you have to rely on 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 expert opinion basically yeah 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 i mean um yeah it's it's difficult i i find that there's just so much like it, there's so many ad hominem attacks like it, which i find so frustrating because even if you even if someone has done something in the past and said something in the past whatever, or is someone even, like is someone who is a quantarian usually, um, that doesn't inv- necessarily invalidate what they're saying. Like people still need to consider the argument on. And so, yeah, I, I think I, I think the, the <laughs> I guess for lack of a better way of putting it, um, just the saturation of logical fallacies into our current environment writ large it goes beyond whether someone is independent or not independent like i think it's 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 a societal issue which i'm not prepared to uh to fully comment on but um yeah yeah it, it, alex did you want to did you want to come on anything well i think the what we've seen is the certainly over the last probably 13 to 14 years is probably the the comprehensive annihilation of what um, Jürgen Habermas once called the public sphere, which was always a very limited concept in a in a in a capitalist society, but even like fifteen years ago when I was in my undergraduate years, like the even back then the intellectual climate was still stifled to a degree because I was in a political science department dominated by thinkers who were all like ascribing to the the wonderful theories of Anthony Giddens and New Labour but uh which is a great way to spend three years of your life but um the even back then like there were like there was a clear role for dissenting opinions inside like the different um social sciences departments at the university I was at and 
just from looking around now like you can you can see like that space close up rapidly over the last 10 years and the 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 where where the two sort of um great what i would describe as sort of bourgeois moral panics in british and american society like brexit in our case trump in the case of the united states that seemed to uh put the really accelerate the process of decay whereby every single issue was framed via you know pro or anti-brexit pro or anti-trump and every single every single critique that could be made of like the existing of the existing order no matter where it came from was if it, it touched on any area that like um brexit aligned politicians had mentioned or trump had mentioned the 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 so-called mainstream immediately had to attack it destroy it and discredit it no matter where it came from or who was saying it so like it seems that what's been completely withdrawn in this period is any ability to any ability for public reasoning and also any ability for people to engage in um trial and error the idea that if you 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 can be wrong on something and interrogate that position and learn from it you're not allowed to do that in the public sphere anymore you've got to be 100 percent aligned with this very rigorously enforced now establishment opinion and that's that kind of seamlessly in this country rolled over from like brexit into covid and now i don't know where it's going to go but it seems that the each of them became really a way for the the ruling class to dr- dramatically um dramatically reinforce its own narratives certainly with brexit and covid and i i think the same is true of the united states as well um certainly it seemed that the I think the whole Trump thing in the United States was probably worse even than the Brexit thing here, uh, given the the amount of just hysterical madness that poured out of that. I mean, we we started doing the show just before the um, or around the time of the the so called six of January storming of the Capitol, which was, we we did a show on it and the time and reflected that it seemed to be more like a sort of um a pantomime than anything else but if you read like the the bourgeois press it was like mussolini's march on rome the siege of madrid um the um the split up of the spice girls and all manner of every uh, all the horrors that was being visited on the innocent quivering politicians of america and thus american democracy itself which is transparently mad and easily easily disproved but it was asserted so hysterically over and over again that it just became, for some people anyway, a, a reality. And it it just seemed that the it just seemed that the the possibilities of even basic disputation have now been removed. Yeah, what's so weird about the the capital thing too is that on the one hand, it, of course, it's true that the you know the government is like exaggerating you know they didn't go in march in with guns they weren't an organized like political unit of any kind um and the, you know there was a kind of weird innocence to it and the fact that like they weren't even wearing masks you know or anything yeah. like that like they weren't covering their identity clearly they didn't really even think that this would happen on the day and they kind of got carried away but there mm-hmm. is but at the same time they still did storm the capital like it's kind of funny it's almost like the some of them because so many of them like didn't think this would happen or didn't think it through at all probably their attitude is almost like did was that wrong (laughs) 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 did we do something wrong (laughs) so you know the thing is like um it, it is true that the elites are misrepresenting it but at the same time like when when you know the masses are storming the capital uh th- that's the point at which elites like really have to give a little bit of ground like i don't think that you would see even for example some of the um the the, the like say even, like the capital gains tax and, like, the, some of the more redistributive stuff that the biden administration is now doing i don't think you would see that if it weren't if the elites weren't a little bit shook by that you know like it, it I think that they have accepted to some degree that they they have to give a little bit of ground or 
they'll lose their heads, you know. Mm. Well, I think that the okay. Um, I was going to say the. I think that there's been there's various attempts from like the ruling classes of Britain and the United States, certainly since 2016, to look as if they're addressing like the pro the the rather transparent problems that are growing in the, in the societies. But the remarkable, well, maybe not remarkable. The striking thing to me is that they there'll be like rhetorical moves in a certain direction. Like even like Theresa May, who's a spectacularly useless politician, made like rhetorical moves towards like um, a try, a saying that she was going to address inequality, um, or like Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak will say like, oh, we're going to establish a national investment bank and we're going to try and regenerate the north of England, that kind of thing, and then you know John McDonnell will go on the TV and cry that they've stolen these policies, um, but. The, the the thing that strikes me about all of this is the way this this attempt then runs into like the various different uh class dominated structures and institutional imperatives and seems to run out of steam even even after the words have left the lips of the speaker um so i think that the they are clearly there's clearly some of them realize that they've got a bit of a problem but i I don't think that the the alignment of forces in society has yet reached the point where they'll start do it, pursuing that in all seriousness. I think that there's a rhetorical move, but I I still think that the uh, the imperatives that exist there at the moment don't push them towards like you know or would push them towards like a sort of New Deal situation, um, because I think one of the things that the last five to six years revealed is that like without a strong working class presence in the political sphere um that that change doesn't happen i don't think the middle class clearly can't do it if they just don't if they just refuse who, who is going to uh who, who is going to like push them to to E- even allow kind of minor reforms. Yeah, yeah. Leila, did you want to come back in? Um, yeah, I think there is something to be said, though, about, um, um, like, es- especially when it comes to science, but also when it comes to, sorry, especially when it comes to the natural sciences, but es- but also when it comes to the social sciences. Um, I think a lack of dynamism, intellectual dynamism, and um, is detrimental to to capital. Um, and so while it may find itself unable to reinvigorate, um, you know, the intellectual, the intellectual production and, and, you know, which requires dissent in order to function properly, especially with science, like with science, you need to co- constantly be, uh, be challenging, um, theories and hypotheses in order and, and testing and redoing, um, experiments in order to verify uh, what you've produced and to to know if whether or not it matches up with empirical reality. Um, I think that actually acts as a fettering force against uh, the ruling class's ability to operate. And so despite itself, um, despite what it may or may not do, I think that the inherent lack of dynamism that comes with the fettering of intellectual production and therefore the fettering of production writ large will cause it to 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 kind of come back in order to to, you know function properly so i think that will be because of um the the things change and the working classes um you know gain more and more ability to reinsert themselves into politics but yeah i think there is something to be said about the about the detrimental effects of the lack of intellectual dynamism to to the, the ruling class even yeah, no, that's interesting. I mean, the a lot of the, um, I, I think one of the ways that they've gotten this far is that basically the, is kind of the immigration model in a way because the big powers uh, basically poach the, um, the, the experts from all around the world. You mm. know, they, they can bring in like the, they can bring in like a ready-made army of engineers basically like any company can do that uh, by just bringing them all to london or new york or california um and so they've probably been able to make up for a certain amount of the lack of dynamism with that but even that runs out because Mm -hmm. if you bring somebody in like say you bring 
you know, you have a tech company or something and you bring in a bunch of brilliant experts from India and China. Well, if the if the if they're not even allowed to if they're not allowed to work in a and think in a free way um, and every you know and, and everything is intensely politicized yeah it's not it's not really going to work um, so maybe I also have to think that these tech companies like um, there must be people high up in the tech companies that see that it's not going to be a good thing to <laughs> to pack your workforce with these ideologues, you know, who are going to be terrible at their job and who are going to be like, you know, me tooing everyone and, you know, like, <laughs> just like making it impossible. Um, but you then also have these weird like bug bug unions, <laughs> these like these pseudo unions that are appearing among um, kind of technical professionals where they 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 even say like their goal is not to get better wages. It's to ensure that the tech companies correctly censor everyone. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, that that's like a, then as far as type thing for the unions, I think that that union. <laughs> um, that makes the old civil service union. I used to be in look good by comparison. <laughs> that makes it that. Yeah. That, I, I, I think you're correct. Like it, I, I think, though, like the problem with capitalism is that it it cannot deal with its contradictions except through crisis. Um, it can just move them around. It can delay it, delay the crisis. It can move it around a little bit, like as with, um, for instance, the bringing in of, um, of, of intelligentsia via immigration, uh, which is a great example, actually, I think. Very good analogy. Um, so I, I, my, my thoughts is that these, um, I, I think that the managers of these places are true believers, actually, like I've, um, after interacting with so many doctors and scientists, when I was researching for COVID-19, like, these folks are true believers, like they don't, they have no doubt at all that what they're doing is correct. In fact, they believe it's correct, and it, that they're helping people. Um, and I think that I suspect that these folks are also kind of in the same mind frame, they believe that they're absolutely correct, and that and, and they're helping society as well. <laughs> um, I think, some of I think the bourgeois, like the high bourgeoisie, probably has a few more skeptical, cynical people. But I actually don't think the ruling class is all that intelligent, to be honest. I, I think that they're an irrational bunch, um, and so I, I don't think they they really think through things through. I think they're very, especially at this point with the large um, fictitious capital bubbles, like the large, large asset bubbles, um, and the uh, precarity of finance right now with the asset bubbles. It's made them extremely irrational. Um, something that me and Alex have discussed a lot. I mean, I guess building kind of small, building institutions um, outside of this world from from scratch, obviously that's very difficult. Um, it has to be the way to go. And also, um, also because of this whole kind of... Um, elite over production environment in which everyone's sort of scrambling to you know take down like somebody who's recently you know been successful so and 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 you know everyone's kind of taking down everyone all the time mm -hmm. um that that has to stop too because i think there has to be some kind of spirit of solidarity among um people who are trying to start new institutions or break out of the existing ones, even among people who don't agree, you know, mm, but who just yes. agree that th those things have to exist. Um, and for that to happen, the, you know, sometimes I find like, even among kind of dissenting voices, there's this really shitty kind of um, resentful, narcissistic tendency to, you know, always like yeah they'll they'll like attack someone who is trying to do something new and who is trying to do be constructive and to create an alternative space for ideas and stuff like that there's always a new little bunch of people who will try to take them down i think anyway the point is basically if you are anyone who has broken out of the institutions and who is trying to build alternative institutions who's trying to create 
the infrastructure for independent voices to exist. If you don't, like, you don't have to just, like, destroy them if you disagree with them on something, you know, just, like, we have to have some kind of level of, uh, <laughs> as I say, a culture of solidarity there, you know, even among the ones we don't agree with. It, it certainly seems to me that in earlier um, um, eras in bourgeois society, there was a bit more of that. Like, you can see, you know, even I... I, I am. I like I'm going to reach into Marxist thinking, but I mean, you can see, for instance, Marx and Engels interacting with people that the intellectual positions that and intellectuals who hold them that they strongly disagree with. Like, for instance, their interactions with Balzac, who was a um, um, a, a royalist. Um, I don't know what his position was exactly. It was like a mo- monarchist, I guess. Um, but still, like not seeking to ruin the person in and of itself and ruin and just like deny that person's ability to do intellectual work and put forward their positions. And I, I agree. And I think it makes sense because I don't know why you'd want to just always be talking to people who agree with you and who have no critique to put forward um, of your own work. I don't know why people think that's a preferable environment. You know, I find it really boring and it just, and as a result, um, the intellectual environment becomes extremely, predictable like you know exactly how different little fake arguments are going to go you know like what point a will be what point b will be and you know what the synthesis will be it's just it's so there's no innovation at all isn't that um isn't that a reflection though of the 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 instability of the economic base filtering its way up because and to go back to the what we were saying about the reaction to trump i mean my thoughts on that and we discussed this on the, on the on the podcast Layla was that the the paranoia and ravings about him even though he didn't really challenge capital in the United States that much was more based on what he might do and what might happen and that he might stimulate some kind of um unpredictability it's the unpredictability in my view that the the system reacts very badly to because everything is so fragile now everything is based on such a thin layer of actual productive economic base in britain and the united states now the like the slightest deviation from the norm e- economically politically or in terms of um cultural or, or cultural norms as well is treated with suspicion and rabid hostility because everything has the capacity to upset that very fragile balance that does exist inside the inside these nations now so i think it's a case of like a very fragile economic base filtering its way through into the the intellectual and uh, cultural life which leads to just um both uh, frenzied hysteria and stagnation at the same time and the hysteria is necessary to stand in for actual um actual uh, actual intellectual production is replaced by just um the hysteria to cover to paper over the cracks of the stagnation yeah and there's such an economic incentive too to to keep chopping off uh, you know all of these um these figures like because everyone is you know, every every kind of knowledge economy or whatever job is so there's like a thousand people going for every one of them. So, the you know the economic incentive to just keep calling sort of like people within the elites and replacing them is there all the time as well. You know, I mean, if you cancel, if you're if you're like the kind of person who wants to get a job at the New York Times or something like that, and you successfully cancel. Uh, that guy donald mcneil was that his name or whoever somebody like that a boomer kind of well that that's a job opening for you you know Mm. um and you may even you may even become a little celebrity for a while if you if you're the successful if you're if you're the person who who got rid of them you know um you can spin a few articles out of that or whatever um so yeah there's this like um i mean this this whole and actually, um, you know, the, the, the new way Anthony Giddens, like, vision of Blairism, which was sort of similar in, in America with, with Clinton, I mean, it was just sort of this set of ideas that dominated in the, in the 90s. Um, but that, the, I guess, like, the Blair vision of, like, massively expanding 
education and massively expanding the creative economy and the knowledge economy and so on, that's like created this monster that we have now. Um, and, you know, the, I, I don't really, the, it's going to be a very hard thing to undo because now all of these people have been sold this vision of this kind of, you know, it used to be that the only people who could really live a cosmopolitan life, have a house in the country and a townhouse and kind of fly, you go around the world, were like a tiny, tiny number of people uh, within the elites. Like, uh, you know, and so this this very attractive vision, um, I think you have to recognize how attractive it is um, to recognize why the people who, why people are going crazy because it's falling apart. It, the attractive vision was sort of like, the entire middle class could be could live like a like a a noble. Mm. They could es- effectively have servants, right? People bringing them food, people taxiing them around. Um, they could live in the middle of one of the great cities. They could fly around the world. You know, all of that stuff. Like that is sort of the thing that's that's kind of falling apart to some degree, and. Um, and the people who have had that dream taken away from them are not taking it well, you know, they're, and, and they're not going to, they're not going to just say, oh, well, this isn't working out. I guess I'll just go and <clears throat> get a manufacturing job. They're, they're instead going to do everything else imaginable to, to fight this, uh, the decline of their, this kind of class that's in crisis. Well, I think that the, I think certainly everything since 2008 um, reflected like the a profound collapse of the, the, the Blair era vision. And as I said, this is something that I was had this inflicted on me in uh, my degree, so I might as well use the, the, the memories of it. Um, the, the, the idea, actually, I, I think it goes back before Blair. It goes, it draws from... Um, it, it draws ultimately from a lot of like the 60s radicalism moving into the 70s and sort of merging with um, consumerist uh, mass consumer society to the point where, like, as you were saying, Angela, the, the, this vision that um, everybody, uh, that suddenly the, the bourgeois lifestyle of the, the 0.5% in British terms was suddenly going to be available to um, the entire middle class and part of the working class as well if they just worked hard enough and if we just got rid of those damn trade unions who were standing in the way uh british capitalism could really take off and of course that didn't happen what happened is that the the so-called neoliberal boom just cannibalizes the country and outsources a ton of stuff and then everything else is just done with the um the elastic band of credit and so by the time we like we reach into 2008 there's there is a crisis of capitalism um but and we've talked about this before layla the 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 response from 2008 and this goes right the way into the corbyn wave that we were discussing before we started recording that wave of radicalism that comes out of it is not working class radicalism because the working class in britain and the united states has already been defeated 10 years 20 years before what happens is you see a revolt of, in British terms, uh, the non-productive workforce based in the public sector and the, uh, the petty bourgeoisie in Britain, or a certain sector of it, revolts. And that powers, initially in a small way, the Miliband leadership in a very confused way. And it, then it certainly powers the Corbyn leadership. And the problem is that the the crisis that, that, that existed in 2008 hasn't produced a mass working class response. It's produced a rebellion of s- sections of the non-productive public sector workforce and the, and the middle class. And you, you can't build a rebellion with that or a meaningful politics with that. And I think that that's reflected in like the failures of both Sanders and Corbyn, really. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I'm going to actually uh, on my Substack. I'm going to go. I'm fascinated by the Blair, by Blairism in general. And one of the people I think is so interesting on Blairism is Peter Hitchens. Um, oh yes, uh, because Peter Hitchens is always an entertaining read. Yeah, because I think he really he has really interesting 
way i'll send you some stuff that i've been watching just like interviews and some stuff i've been reading because he talks about like um for example the marxism today which i i knew a little bit about but like a lot of the 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 um the ideas of blairism um you know even stuff like um this idea of like pop culture being uh being of interest to like sort of almost like almost like as society became more unequal creating a kind of culture in which there was like cultural egalitarianism so elitism all forms of cultural elitism would be removed and everyone would be like writing a phd about the simpsons <laughs> like that, that, dream. That, that that's very much a marxism today vision actually yeah because wasn't their whole thing like um, like low culture for highbrows or something was, like that? Th- th- um, if I'm remembering this rightly, like the, it was the Marxism Today being the official journal of the old Communist Party of Great Britain, which was liquidated uh, by its own leadership in the middle 80s. Um, Mar- Marxism Today, there being their journal, like it was written for by uh, characters like Stuart Hall, the, uh, the 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 West Indian British sociologist, and like they were very much at the they were very much involved in the Kinnock leadership. Um, there, a lot of the intellectual, so called intellectual stuff that was done by like um, Kinnock's advisor Brian Gould uh, came from the Marxism Today. And they were very much of the view that, like, um, that certain changes from the Thatcher period should be embraced, and that the um, they bought into this idea that the the working class was not up for you know the class struggle anymore. What they wanted was to play their full part in like this wonderful festival of consumer society that was being offered by the Tories and what the what the the job of like the they saw their job as being was to find a way as to turn that to what they called uh, I'm making the air quotes now progressive ends and that's exactly what well it's not exactly what but if that filters through into blairism and it filters through into the idea that um uh well you you may not be able to afford x y and z to you know you may not be able to afford like this exact house or this exact car but you can feel as if you can uh that was like the the whole thing like um you can you can really feel as if you're part of something even though you're not and the the the, war, the barriers to you, the barriers to your participation in this culture are as big as they ever were but we're going to work really hard at pretending as if you can mm. Mm. and can i ask you as well what is the connection between like the fabian tradition and do, would you see that as a continuation of of a kind yeah, of well, the, the big myth that the Labour left likes to tell itself about Blair in general is that he was a complete interloper, that he was this outside force that came in and cannibalised the Labour Party. But my view on it is that he was a natural outgrowth of the Labour right wing, including the Fabian tradition, which has always been a strong part of the Labour right wing. He was... And you saw this to a degree with like a previous Labour leader like Hugh Gateskill, who died just before um, the, the 64 election, was replaced by Harold Wilson. They'd been out of power for 13 years. So the idea of the Labour right when they've been out of power is, well, let's just adopt whatever it is that the Tories are doing and water it down and make it, you know, put a Labour spin on it. Now, that was even that was that was at a time when there was a strong working class and the Soviet Union still existed. So when you get like the 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 double whammy of like the very, very painful defeat of the industrial working class, deindustrialization and the end of official socialism in the form of the Soviet Union, the, the turn of China to capitalism. Well, then you've got um, the, the labor right completely unmoored from any working class pressure just becomes i mean they were always looking for a form of social democracy that british capitalism would accept and then when the form of it that it will accept is basically like um well almost nothing so what they do is they repackage like the 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 political uh framework that john major was pursuing anyway and put their own spin on it but 
yeah, to, to conclude the thought, Blairism, Blair, is just the Labour right completely unmoored and, un, uh, and detached from all working class pressure and with no other societal model left in the world to be compared to, that's what they became. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> what's interesting about Hitchens' kind of framing of it is what he says is like people who are economistic in their thinking tend to view Blair as as a centrist, as watered down and so on. And because in, in an economic sense, um, you know, because of that lack of labor militancy that you talk about or the, the absence of it. But what he says is that that sort of often misses the... The, the fact that their their vision like that they were very radical in a, in a bad way I guess they they in that they they really did want to like remake society profoundly and remake like the human soul and kind of you know they 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 had they, they wanted to yeah just like really fundamentally transform um, society in other ways, like in, in, in cultural and moral and institutional ways. Um, and that they achieved that, like they did just like completely remake Britain in many ways. How much of that, um, how much of that was, was Blair planned that out and how much was just uh, an unfolding from the, um, his economic program which was basically the marketization of absolutely everything um the uh cannibalization of the public sector but a hidden cannibalization and that it was never done openly it was always done through like outsourcing and sort of semi-privatizations but the the i know hitchens talks a lot about the the the, the sort of the moral revolution or moral counter-revolution whichever way you want to look at it um I mean, I, I think that undoubtedly some of them did believe that. And um, for some of them, it was, uh, I think for some of these uh, Blairist figures, it was their, um, they substituted that for uh, any, like, uh, any and all economic attempts at, like, um, changing society had gone out of the window for them, like, a long time ago, however limited it might have once been. So, and also, uh, one thing I do agree with Hitchens on is when he says, I think it's in his book, The Abolition of Britain, when he says uh, that the, 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 he calls them the, the, the left, the Blairites, whatever, uh, had to come up with a fantasy version of the British ruling class to fight against. I mean, that's very true, because if you look at like what the all the left in Britain talks about in terms of like the British ruling class, they still think it's 1935. They still think like uh, we're still ruled over by like uh, Neville Chamberlain and like that uh, sort of uh, bizarre aristocracy. Whereas in actual fact, like you look at like the uh, British capitalism and the ruling class are actually a very dynamic thing. And that that's changed. That, that those guys went out with like Alec Douglas home in the sixties, but for but for Blair and New Labour to be considered to be radical, they had to conjure up this phantom of what the British ruling class was in order to counterpose themselves against it. Because otherwise, what are you left with? You're left with the fact that uh, the, they're continuing much of John Major's economic legacy, and that doesn't look very appealing. So you have to counterpose yourself against a fantasy in order to get away with it, I think. Yeah, I mean, this is so much, that phantom... You know, this is so much so important to how the <clears throat> let's just call it the cultural left sort of operates, um, kind of cultural progressivism operates. And I think to a large degree, like a lot of some people who I think kind of have missed the point in some way say, well, you know, um, so somebody like Trump or isn't really that important because his economic like policies were not radical and and so on. But it's more that his appearance gave his opponents the um, opportunity to create a phantom around which they could consolidate all of the elites. You know what I mean? So, like, it's not he, he himself is not the important thing. It's the fact that they seized the opportunity to have an actual living person, you know, who they could who, who they could. Um, who, who could become this ultimate hate figure 
Um, but actually what they were doing amongst themselves was, was what was really important. It wasn't really about him. Um, you, you also see this in this endless conversations about like, um, you know, they always try to pretend that it's still the 1950s or something and that like, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> th- th- that we still live in this like really traditional society or something. And it's so, it's so ridiculous yeah. and it's so obviously wrong. But mm. but through the repetition of it, mm. um, the endless repetition over and back to each other, it's almost like in a religion, like, you know, everyone has to believe for it to work, you know, and they, 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 they just repeat, 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 um, you know, that this this obviously completely nonsensical, you know, thing, faith belief that we're that we still live under this like um, traditional system. And and how it really functions is just to strengthen their um, class solidarity and strengthen their interconnectedness and kind of uh, sense of I guess moral like uh, moral righteousness or having a mission. Um, mm. But it's a total phantom. It's it's just a total phantom. It, it doesn't even you know it's it, it really is like pure faith like they they've decided that they are going to all believe in this fiction together Hmm. yeah i think there's a lot to that like i think i like your comment about how people pretend like we've never left the 50s basically and there's been no progress on things like civil rights and you know women's issues and whatever whatever have you um i think it's a big issue in the bourgeoisie because they I think that the the role that um, um, these myths p- play in the ruling class is very important because they they can't innovate past that point like the only innovation can come from the working class and so they must continuously revisit these these battles which they have won already decades ago you know, or as, as won them as far as they are able to do so as the ruling class. And they have to replay them out again and again. And um, to give meaning, meaning and purpose to to them themselves as a class, like to I think I think that a lot of the ideology that we view that we see today being produced is is not geared towards the working class. It's actually geared towards um, primarily the petty bourgeoisie, but also to convince the ruling class itself to give itself an explanation as to what's going on. So if I can, you know, for instance, the COVID thing, like I really do see that as a way that the bourgeoisie is using, it's using COVID and the pandemic to explain away the um, the economic downturn, which I, I mean, Alex view as just a, it was, it was just a, a recession that started before COVID-19 came on the scene and, um, and is as a result of the natural contradic- of the contradictions of capitalism. So it was just a crisis that was going to come. But like they they use this like the story of the pandemic and all these different things as a way of explaining away the contradictions of capital and making themselves feel better. So I think that has I think there's a lot to that. And do like, you think I really that think you know this mm-hmm. idea that they're kind of there's like a a sort of de going on where they're they just consolidating like a few mega corporations and sort of wiping out a lot of the rest of the economy. Is that the, is that the project? In my, in my view, no, I don't, I don't see it that way. Like I think that the antagonist was always the working class. Um, I think what happened with the pandemic to give the short version is that, um, like we had a situation where uh, capitalism was going to fall into a recession and that does come with in any recession, you'll see a, um, the, the, uh, the closing of many small businesses, for instance, that happens in any recession because there's a lot of churn in that sec in that sector. Um, so I think what happened in COVID is that it came on the scene at the same time as a kind of just by coincidence at the same time that a recession was, had started. So you can see that had started from like many signs, like for instance, uh, un- uh, unemployment rate was decreasing and then it starts slowing down months before the pandemic, before COVID-19 becomes part of the lexicon. And you also see the Fed um, start quantitative easing months before as well. So this is a sign that there was, yeah, there was trouble. And also like Alex has pointed out, 
Trump uh, starts changing his starts like tweeting and making comments about the economy in a different maybe Alex can fill this in but he starts like talking about how great the numbers are and trying to distract people from the fact that unemployment numbers have stagnated and have no are no longer on the decrease um months before covid hit so my view is instead that um the uh lockdowns hit at a time where um which kind of uh concealed the recession and um i do think that the ruling class really did think that um covid-19 was going to be like this big deadly pandemic which would kill off a significant portion of the working class. And you can see this in like editorials from like Bill Gates and all of these big like bourgeois people. Um, and so they reacted like very violently and they applied these lockdowns to the full, the biggest extent that they could, which really just meant that they would never, they would never shut down production, production, productive activity, like the productive labor, um, commodity production and also realization. They could only shut down the unproductive segments of the economy, which does include like a lot of, um, services, which are primarily provided by smaller businesses. So I think that's more so what happened. Like, and, and then once the lockdown kind of started, because it served such a useful function to explain away the contradictions of capital, also, um, it had p- different political um, advantages, like with uh, getting Trump out. I think that was a big motivation. It just kind of like it took on a political economy of its own. And it just like and that's that's what, that's what's brought us here today. Um, long story short, <laughs> if that Do makes you think sense. think that it, it, like is there basically not going to be any return? Like, do you think that it's just fundamentally reshaped the economy and that's the way and that will define like how the, the the years or decades ahead after the the pandemic. Um, no, I I I actually feel like uh, this will not fundamentally reshape the economy because um, I feel like this merely excel- it may accelerate some trends that were already in place. So I think that's probably a better way of looking at it. So. Um, me and Alex are big, um, we, we find Lenin's theory of imperialism really helpful for understanding what's going on. And so, um, what I think what we'll, what, what we'll see is a continued consolidation of small capitals into big capitals, um, and a increasing importance of finance capital that will just continue. Um, I think what the pandemic did more so is reveal the lack of, working class organization and strength um, and which kind of makes this era kind of a uh, time of pure bourgeois politics. And so what we're seeing is like this, these draconian impositions on our civil liberties and rights um, because there's no one to fight and defend them anymore. And that used to be the working classes. And so it's, it's a little hard to accept. Like I, it's been hard for me to accept that this is actually just, how capitalism is in the absence of a militant working class. Uh, But yeah, I get to answer your question. I I don't think that this will reshape the economy in any way that it wouldn't have eventually came to um, in absence of the subjective factor of the working classes rising up and, you know, kind of imposing their irrational, um, like imposing rationality to the system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's mostly been an acceleration, but it's been a devastating acceleration. Like, um... And that's it for part one of our interview with Angela Nagel. Tune in on our Patreon page next week where we'll be putting up part two, which will cover everything from the coronavirus outbreak and the response of the Irish government to it, to the uh, economic trajectory of Ireland since independence and the uses and misuses of art in this late period of capitalism. Be sure to join us there and I hope you enjoy the programme.